Today we're going to be doing a little bit more of a sciencey video. I know that you guys like it when we do sciencey type content. We're going to learn today. And specifically speaking, we're going to be talking about point of impact shift and what causes it, how to mitigate it, that sort of thing. I've had several questions come in in recent weeks. I have heard you. We are going to address those right here and now. This is not just theoretical. We're actually going to be going out and testing it. And stay tuned to the end of the video because we are actually going to induce point of impact shift so you guys can see exactly what's going on. All right, guys, we're gonna lead off with unsuppressed first, get a baseline, see where things shooting, and then we'll go from there. And for that, we're gonna be shooting my MI-15F. It's a 5.56 NATO, 16 inch barrel. It's topped with a Nikon Black Force 1000. That's a 30 millimeter, what would be termed an LPVO scope by today's standards, even though it predates that term. For ammunition, we're gonna be shooting Fiocchi 223 Mark D. And that is a 77 grain match grade loading. I'm not gonna promise match grade performance because I'm doing the shooting, but I wanna take as much ammunition variability as, out of it as we could today. So that's what we're gonna do. That's a pretty decent group for three shots at 50 yards. Now in my mind, the easiest way to talk about point of impact shift is as it pertains to suppressors. This is the most complicated thing that you can add to the end of your gun. It's gonna change the most factors. While all the things that we're gonna talk about have to do with all muzzle devices and all firearms, this is gonna do the most. So here we go. Number one, the most obvious, if the bullet touches anything, that's bad. It used to be that when we talked about suppressors that we had destructible structure inside this a device like this. And the idea is the bullet would literally punch through it and degrade it over time. That's obviously bad for accuracy and precision and things like that if the bullet is running into something that is destroying itself. So now you can see clear through this thing, for instance, we have precision machining that allows us to get pretty close to the bullet without ever touching it. It gives us a good enough seal without doing that. Likewise, if you're talking about a muzzle device or something like that, if the bullet is touching anything on the way out, it's going to change how the bullet hits on target. Number two is barrel harmonics. So if you look at that barrel, it's made of metal. And you would think, well, eh, metal, fairly substantial. It's not gonna really move a whole lot. However, if you watch with a high enough speed camera, you will see that that barrel absolutely does flex and move around. A shockwave propagates through that barrel. Part of it happens before the bullet leaves the muzzle. And that is going to impact how the bullet hits on target. Now this is gonna look really ridiculous, I, I promise, but it all makes sense. I'm going to balance this container on it like this. And the reason why is because these two buffers paired with the weight of the dish equals the weight of this can. And survey says pretty much the same point of impact. Now the group's a little bit bigger, probably because I was shuffling around a whole lot. And I couldn't just stay in one spot. I had to reset the thing each time. But then also, there's probably a little bit of variability in there because of the, the way the barrel's whipping. Uh, again, the important thing, though, to note is that we're hitting here instead of, like, over here, up there, you know, some stuff like that. When it, we're talking about this, this is usually something that we're worried about when we're talking about longer range shooting. This is usually not something that we're going to be worried about when we're talking about the ranges that most of us shoot at. Number three, internal entropy. I want you to imagine this thing is mounted to the front of this firearm here. There is a volume in front of the bullet inside that barrel. There's also a volume inside this can that is occupied by gas atmosphere. And when that bullet is launched down range, it compresses all that gas in front of it. Some of it's gonna leak around the projectile, but for the most part, it's gonna get compressed and it has to go somewhere to get out of the way. It's gonna flow out the end of that can. The bullet has to fly through that environment. So there's a lot of movement going on with all of the gas being expelled from this can as the bullet makes its exit. Oh. 
that chaotic situation inside this device is going to impart small component vectors on that bullet as it leaves. And the farther it goes down range, the more and more those are gonna be prolific. We're gonna mount it on top of the brake to start with. To start with, we're gonna do the 30 caliber aperture on the end, and I'll let you guys know when we change to the 5.56 aperture. I'm not super happy with that, so I'm gonna shoot a couple more right on top of that. I think I may have pulled this guy right here. There you go, a little bit more indicative of what it should look like. So to test that, I've got a couple different mounting solutions for this that are gonna change how the gas is injected into the can. And then I also have some different end caps here that are gonna change how the gas flows out of the can. From the brake to the flash hider. So this is like a three prong flash hider. This is not a select fire gun. Okay, so we only have one on target. The other ones, however many there were, uh, must have missed the target from the recoil. I'm probably just gonna shoot three more additional on top of that. Okay, so there doesn't appear to be anything broken inside the gun, so it must have just been fluke. I don't know what's going on. And there you have it with the flash hider. Now, quickly for today's timeout, uh, I actually don't have a sponsor. And the reason why is I want to talk to you guys about something that I believe is going on and we're going to test it in today's video. I believe that this video, even though there's absolutely nothing wrong with this one, is going to be demonetized and shadow banned because we talked about this. That's a problem because that sets the narrative on how these things are talked about, by whom they're talked about, and that can ultimately marginalize their ownership and that allows it to be attacked. I believe that it's going to perform poorly and therefore I did not get a sponsor for this one because I thought it would be unethical. So I would also ask if you feel so inclined, please check out our Patreon and subscribe star pages. And that allows you guys to donate directly to keep content like this on this channel. Thanks. So I'm pretty sure that you guys can see this in this light. My shades are a little bit dark, but there's a white line right there. And that is right at 12 o'clock as far as the orientation of the can is concerned. What I'm going to do is I'm going to back off the brake and put a washer in there. And that's going to change its orientation space. It's important that it's not just dangling there free on the threads. It's actually backed up against something, but it's timed differently for this test. So I put the largest shim that I've got and the smallest shim that I've got on there. And instead of being straight up and down, as you can see there, this is now almost 270 degrees out of phase. So three quarters of a revolution out of phase. I wanted 90, 270 is the opposite of 90. So it's the opposite direction. So three quarters of a revolution. Same spot, doesn't seem to matter as long as it's supported. We're going from 30 caliber to 5.56 caliber end caps. I think I pulled that one. I'm gonna shoot one more. A little bit of deviation from where the majority of the groups are being, but still not enough that I would be concerned about this kind of point of impact shift. And also it looks like I did not pull one. Number four is dwell time. And we're actually not gonna spend any time on dwell time, but just really quick, the reason we're not gonna spend any time is because I've done multiple videos on it. I'll have those linked down below. You can look them up if you care. But again, to our example, it artificially increases the length of the barrel. It's not 100%, okay, you don't get, you don't get an additional five inches of barrel by putting a five inch can on the end of it. Like that's not, that's not real. But the powder is still burning as it moves through the can, it can impart more push on the bullet. And that's why sometimes, depending on how the can is constructed, you can see a 20 to 50 feet per second increase in the velocity of your bullet. And last but not least, alignment. Alignment is a huge deal. And for that, we're just gonna go to the range and then we'll recap. 
So what we're gonna do now is try to induce a problem. Direct thread adapter on this guy, and that's a 30 cal, 5 h 24. Just so happens though, that I have a thread pitch adapter that takes us up to 5 8 by 24. I do not advise you that you do this. Tolerance stacking is a big problem. Whenever you add a junction, you add a source of potential error that can stack on top of error, on top of error, on top of error. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna thread this thing on about halfway. Hear that? That is the can literally moving in place. You can probably see that. I've also moved over to the 30 cal aperture. And the idea that we're trying to accomplish is the bullet is gonna start out in the center of the aperture because it's homed in the center, but the can is drooping a little bit. So it is now no longer gonna fly in the geometric center of that aperture, and it is going to get closer to that aperture as it gets closer to the end of the can. And that is going to cause a problem. I hope that we don't destroy this thing, but I'm pretty sure that Energetic will help us out with our science. So here we go. Okay, we have no damage to the end of our can. Not as prolific as I thought it was gonna be, but uh, I think we're gonna have to try it again. Okay, so that's what I get for trying to be conservative. Now I'm going for all the marbles. This thing can move a heck of a lot. Okay, this is what I'm talking about. This is point of impact shift. I left these ones uncovered so you can see where we were shooting. Here we are now. Definitely, this is something I would be concerned about. Concerned about. If we had used something this long, we probably would have had a problem. The reason I went to 30 cal is because it allows that thing to droop and gives us more space to traverse the can. And what we're talking about, if you guys weren't understanding, is if this thing is mounted and then allowed to droop, that's a severe exaggeration. But the idea is that if I try to fire this round like this, then it gets close to the structures as we get farther down the can. And up until a few years ago, we kind of guessed mathematically that this is what was going on, but we didn't actually get to visualize it until Destin from Smarter Every Day did several tests on suppressors. I'll have his, I'll have a montage of the stuff that he's done that pretty much validates what we in the industry have thought about the fluid dynamics that govern everything that goes on inside of cans. If the bullet gets too close to an internal structure, the turbulence on the surface can then impart a force on the bullet. So the reason why this is such an important thing relative to everything else that we saw. If you notice that everything else we talked about in this video, small changes, very, very minimal, for the most part, not anything that we would care about until we did that last thing. We screwed up the alignment and then it's throwing it everywhere without ever touching the suppressor whatsoever. The reason that creates such a big deal is because of the energy involved. We're talking about energy that is tied directly to the mass and the velocity of the bullet. We're talking about something that's going 2,500 feet per second, probably closer to 3,000 feet per second for this specific test, but there are rifles in this room that'll do 3,600 or higher. That's a lot of energy. And when you disrupt the dynamics at the surface of the bullet by getting too close to something and you see those that mock angle coming off of that bullet and that gets disrupted by some kind of structure, it pushes against the bullet and it can cause a major deflection and how the bullet acts in three-dimensional space as it's traveling down range. And that is why I highly recommend one of these. This is a Surefire alignment rod. I have never taken a dime from Surefire. I would absolutely take their money though. So hey, you guys are Surefire, you watching this, call me up. Anyway, that's the end of the video for today, guys. As always, thank you for watching. If you have ideas for science -y type content that you would like to see tested here at the VSO Gun Channel, sound off in the comment section down below. Help us break the algorithm by having a boisterous conversation down below. And hopefully we'll see you guys on a future video here at the VSO Gun Channel. Thank you for watching.
like, share, subscribe.